Medrash brings the Pasik that Avraham Avinu was Baba Yomim, he got older, Zoken Baba Yomim, and the Rebbe Shalom blessed him Bakol with everything. Bakol. In a few different positions in the Medrash, what Bakol refers to. Bakol, one position is he had a son, Gimatria of Bakol, is Ben. Another is he had a daughter, and her name was Bakol. It was up till that point he did have a son, but he didn't yet have a daughter. And if you hold that position, that you need a son and a daughter in order to fulfill the mitzvah of Pirya Varevya, of reproducing, which is first mitzvah that's actually mentioned in the Torah, mentioned in relation to other Mauritian, then taken and given to Klal Yisrael later. Third position is that Bakol is the mitzvah of sukkah. Question is, obvious, why would sukkah be referred to as bakol with everything? Okay, question number one. Question number two. Gemara relates that on the day of judgment, the Goyim are going to ask for a mitzvah. They're confronted with the truth, how they failed. And the Benisham says, I have an easy mitzvah for you guys. He gives them the mitzvah of sukkah and quickly they go and build sukkahs. The Benisham takes the sun out. It's a blisteringly hot day. They get very frustrated, angry. They run out of the sukkah and they kick the sukkah on their way out. Commentaries discuss that a Jew, if he's in pain, serious discomfort in the sukkah, is also exempt from the mitzvah of sukkah. But he doesn't kick the sukkah when he exits. We'll come back to this point, why this point would be necessary for the message that's involved. So our question then it should be, why, of all the mitzvahs in the Torah, is sukkah chosen as the differentiator, the litmus test, to separate between the Jew and the non-Jew? How come the Rebbe Shem said, I have an easy, a lot of easy mitzvahs. Of all the easy mitzvahs, sukkah is chosen, and they fail. OK. Two questions. Third question. The tour brings that the three Yom Tevim, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, correspond to the patriarchs. Avram to Pesach, Yitzchak to Shavuos, and Yaakov to Sukkot. Now Yaakov, early on, says that he put his cattle in a sukkah. The first mention of the word sukkah it corresponds with Yaakov. Two, we could understand it in another way. Yaakov, the Ramban already points out in Parshas Lech Lecha, that you find that Avram and Yitzchak spoke to the world community. They were kirah b'shem Hashem. They went out to proselytize for the seven mitzvahs of the Noahide Code. They spoke directly to the world. You do not find by Yaakov that he goes out and is kirah b'shem Hashem. Why not? 
says the Ramban, because Yaakov now creates a new reality. Avram produced the Yishmael, Yitzhak and Esav. Terminology is used that their progeny were not complete. They weren't shleiman. Yaakov produces the shifte kor, the tribes. And though we have descriptions of certain failings of the tribes, alongside that, we have Chazal teaching us that they were all tzaddikim. Whatever their failings were, there was some calculation. It was a mistake in cheshben, a mistake in calculation, misjudgment. And they did tshuva. So Yaakov now brings Klal Yisrael in the development of the nation to a point where we still want tikkun ha'olam. But it's going to happen a different way. It's going to happen not through us going directly through the world, to the world, is going to happen by us perfecting ourselves as a nation and then as a nation impacting the rest of the world. We have from Kadmainim a Messias Es Avrom Bakol in Gematria is Tikkun Oilam. Now somehow Sukkah then, there's an irony here, there's a paradox. What is the paradox? The paradox is that Yaakov now is then say, being told, work from within. Cry yourself. Create a model. And then this model will then be a working laboratory. We no longer go out and proselytize to the world. What do we, what do we want to do ideally? Demonstrate to the world. How do we demonstrate? By creating a working ideal society that is a model to emulate in El Chisol. And the thrust of this energy acts as a magnet and draws people to come to us. When that doesn't happen, what does happen? Klajaso then gets dispersed, and Klajaso then has to create some kind of a force that picks up filings of sanctity, nitsaitsas of kedusha, sparks of sanctity in the world and bring them back. But ideally, if we would put our act together here in El Chisal, we wouldn't have to be dispersed to get those sparks of kedusha. They would come here. There's a very interesting Rabbi Kivega. Rabbi Kivega talks in Lain in the Pasha that the Rebbe Nishalem offered, and according to the interpretation of Chazal, the Rebbe Nishalem went through Seya and Poron, that the Rebbe Nishalem offered the Torah at Sinai to the non-Jewish world, and they rejected it, each for their own reasons. Rabbi Kivega was once asked, how come we find Geirim that are tzaddikim? And we find Jews that are rather obnoxious in their relation to our Messias. Rabbi Kivega said there's no question that when the non-Jews were offered the Torah, the overwhelming majority rejected it in each place, Yishmoel and Esau, but there must have been individuals that wanted it. And these Geirim are the children of those individuals. When Klai did accept the Teira, overwhelmingly, there must have been individuals that were not so happy with it. These Jews are the children of those, of those people who didn't really want it. Rabbi Kivega. Okay, so what is the paradox? The paradox is that Sukkot is the time that we energize the entire world. We bring kobonus, we bring sacrifices for the non-Jewish world. Goa makes the brilliant cheshbin 
of how it works out for Yishmoel and for Esav, the exact amount of Kabonis. There are 70 nations, 70 Kabonis, and how the days correspond with the Kabonis, with the beautiful diuk that you see what is the reference to, to Yishmoel and what's the reference to Siachatos, and when it's Chatos, it works out. It's a uh, fascinating go. Okay, but it's, it's the time that we are helping the world get its sustenance. The bounty of the world is rooted in what Klai Yisrael does in Eretz Yisrael, and Klai Yisrael from Eretz Yisrael goes out an energy, a force which supplies whatever kind of sustenance is going to be had for the rest of the world. Isn't it ironic then that at the time that we are addressing ourselves to sustain, support, help the nations of the world, that's the time that we're being more introverted, we're being more Yaakov-like, which is to create mechitzas. This corresponds, of course, with the idea that Avram called the place of the Beis Migdash a har, a mountain, Yitzchok a soda, a field, and Yaakov bias. Bias has mechitzas. Mechitzas keeps that which is outside out and that which is inside in. It separates. So somehow, there's a, the paradox here is you want to help the world, you want to bring about, you want to bring about Tikkun Olam, be more Jewish, not less Jewish. Don't immediately skip the step of being a universalist who skips the steps. We have to go let Kaiser get another child into Cheder, another boy into Osameach, another girl into Neve Yerushalayim. That's how you're bringing about Tikkun Olam. What does that have to do with China and Africa? It does. Because you're bringing about a more perfect society, and this society will more likely create this spiritual energy, which will then as an entity, as an entity, impact the rest of the world. That's our prescription, that's our remedy. Anything else? As you remember the story of the dike that burst in Holland and the young boy who put his finger in to hold the, to hold the bursting water pouring forth? Temporary solution. This candidate, that candidate, this form of government, that form of government, of course we should support anything that's reasonably sane and fair. We have to be supported. We're not a priority of our energies. Our ed energies are another child in Techeda, another base Madush. Why? Because that brings about Tikkun Olam. Because it creates the force and the energy and the community that from there, it's what's going to happen. Okay, so Klai Yisrael, along this route, creates certain models. There is a model that's inherent and built into Torah. Yaakov represents Emes, truth. Tita in Emes Yaakov, the Novi Micho says. Avram is chesed, that corresponds with kindness, extroverted kindness. He reaches out to the world. Yitzchak is gvura. While he reaches out to the world, he's yet involved in a kind of self-perfection and spiritual excellence. Yaakov is Torah, he immerses himself in learning and deals with the challenges that are put on his plate. It would seem that Emes is the climax of 
was begun by Avron, Yitzchak, climaxes with Yaakov. Chesed, Yira, extroverted, more introverted Yitzchak, Emes, the equilibrium, the spiritual equilibrium that only can be had through Torah. And that now has to facilitate impacting the rest of the world. <coughs> Jews then have been charged with a mission. And that mission is to take the universe, take the world, take the resources, and utilize them for spirituality. Vilna Gon brings famous Gon, the Posik in Tilim, I involve, but he be shalim suko, umonose betzion, that completion, sukkah, beshalim, yushalayim, sukkah, moinose in his dwelling place in Zion. That's an allusion to two mitzvahs that one enters in with the entire body. Sukkah and Yishuv El One comes in with one's entire body. Some people, I'm sure, are thinking, what about mikveh? Mikveh, there's no mitzvah. The duration in the mikveh is no mitzvah. You should be in and out. The practice of some chassidim notwithstanding, right? There's no mitzvah to stay longer in the mikveh. Reb Chaim says the taira is the moment of exiting. El Tisrael and Sukkah, the mitzvah is more time in the Sukkah, more time in El Tisrael. The being there, the state of being there is the mitzvah. So let's try and understand what these two mitzvahs have in common and why it would seem, <coughs> we're coming back to our earlier question, why is Sukkah the test that separates between Jew and non-Jew. When a non-Jew sent a sacrifice to the Beis Migdish, when the Beis Migdish was up and running, it was always treated as a Korban Ola. Korban Ola is completely consumed on the Mizbeach. Nothing is eaten. A Shlomim, part is eaten. Yemor Menachis, in discussing why is that true, the Gemara says that it's not scriptural derivation, it's not the halacha Moshe Messinai, it's a svola, it's a self-evident proposition that the non-Jew understands that when you're engaged in spirituality, it's to the exclusion of the material world. It's either or. Either you're engaged in spirituality or in the material world, in the physical. One or the other. The Jew says, no, that's not the way it is. You have to capture the resource of the material, physical universe and utilize it for spirituality because that's where the way the Rebbe designed us and designed the world. There are inherent sparks of sanctity in everything. That's the way the Svasemis learns that Bolok says to Bilom, Am Yotzam Mitzrayim, people came out of Mitzrayim, the Chisa Seino Oletz. They've changed our attitude towards the material world. They tell us it's all spiritual. We can't just merely indulge for the sake of indulgence because then we're missing an opportunity. There's a resource here that can be exploited. They've changed radically. As our prime enemies of the last era and through history have always said, Yomach Shemom, the Jews are the conscience of the world. But the non-Jew relates to life and spirituality like people would relate or do relate to a radio program or a television program 
and there's a sponsor. People tolerate the commercial in order to get back to the program. They tolerate the spirituality a few moments from the sponsor to get back to the program of life. Indulging. The Jew says, no. The whole program is one long message. What is the message? It's spirituality. And since, if I'm speaking to a tzibu that speaks English, try and speak English. I'm speaking to a human being, I have to speak through the physical. He has to access spirituality through his empirical senses, through his senses. So he needs experience. He needs to hold the lulav and shake the lulav. He needs to smell the psalmen. There's a, there are realities, but each is clothing, cloaking an inherent resource of spirituality. There's an energy there from within. used to tell the story in New York of a Jew, very short, thin Jew. He's out one day, gets lost, winds up in an Irish section of Brooklyn, wanders into a tavern to get a cold drink, two Irishmen sitting down the other end of the bar, and he orders a cold beer. And they're having a contest. Each is taking an orange with an empty glass and seeing who can squeeze the orange with one hand and fill the cup with more juice. This is Jew sitting the other end, these two burly Irishmen getting rather noisy. And finally, they look at him down at the other end, drinking his cold beer. And they roll down an orange down the bar. And they say, OK, Jew, let's see what you can do. Jew looks up, very unabashed, non, non-impressed, nonplussed. And he says, please, could you give me the orange that you just squeezed? They look at him, they give him the orange that they just squeezed. He takes the squeezed orange, re-squeezes it, and fills up an overflowing cup of juice. They look at him in awe. They say, how did you do that? What did you do? He said, I'm a fundraiser for a Jewish organization. <laughs> But the analogy, the analogy works. That's the way we approach spirituality. There's juice in every orange. That juice, we access our connection to the juice before we taste it. When Chazal say, cite the stira, Lashem Aloy, everything belongs to the Banishlam, all the, the inventory of the world. And then it says, was in the son of Neodom has been given to man. Pre-bracha or post-bracha? Pre-bracha, it's the Rebbeinish Lanams. Post-bracha, you've accessed now that there is a correspondence and there is a significance between the design of the taste bud and the design of this orange or this peach. Everything in the world did not have to taste delicious. It didn't have to deliver the enzymes that are acting upon the nerve cells that are sending the message to your brain. How many synapses and nerve connections are there involved in creating this experience of delivering that pleasure? If you recognize this hashgocha, it's providential. And there's a message. One, one Hollywood producer in my time who was famous for his outrageous statements, he was criticized that his films 
had no message. They were very superficial. To which he responded, when I want to send a message, I use Western Union. The Jew says, no, everything is a message. Everything is an opportunity, and the Rebbe Nishan is communicating with us, and that's why we are designed. First, the Torah was written, and then we would create it in relation to that blueprint, and the halacha is a methodology of decoding the spiritual chemistry between myself and eternity, between myself and my creator which is how I plug into eternity. Okay, so sukkah is this message. And it's a good case to be made. That's what's meant by the Medrash, that bakol, the Rebbein Shem blessed Avram, bakol with everything is sukkah. Why sukkah? Because bakol means every facet. It's the only mitzvah that you fulfill while you're asleep other than sleeping in Eretz Yisrael. Inhabiting Eretz Yisrael is a mitzvah. Going to the Rabban, going to many others. Helping build the sukkah. You're creating a mechitza and another mechitza. And you're keeping something out and you're keeping something in. There's privacy, but call yourself the entire Jewish people, the Ruim theoretically could sit in one sukkah. So it's interesting. It's this message then that on the day of judgment, when the non-Jews ask for a mitzvah and the rebellion gives them a mitzvah of sukkah and they fail because this violates, like Bollock said, They've changed their attitude towards the physical universe because there's nothing that's unavailable to be utilized theoretically for sanctity. What is sanctity? Designating its purpose, orienting it towards its prime function, which is to give forth the juices of spirituality, the energy, that reside in everything in the Berea, in creation. First Rashi, we're going to read soon, talks about the Rebbe begins with creation, the Torah. Why not begin with the first mitzvahs that are given to Klai Yisrael, if that's what it's all about? Because they're going to come along and complain. They're going to have a problem with us being in Eretz Yisrael. We had to establish that the Shalom created this world and made, assigned the positions according to who could do what best and should do what. And Eretz Yisrael was given to Am Yisrael. And it's to the benefit of the world that we should be here and do our thing the way we're supposed to do it. It's to the world's advantage. We have sources that indicate if the non-Jews would have understood what the Beis Migdish meant for them, to them, they would have protected the Beis Migdish from being destroyed. That's the source of the energy for any brocha any blessing that comes to the world. We're missing it, and they're missing it. The way it's going to come about is by us being more Jewish, not less Jewish. The apologetic agenda of being less chauvinistic, less ethnocentric, it's absurd. Because it's like saying that don't develop your talents and your abilities, which will later be put at the service of the community. Nobody should become a surgeon. Nobody should become a doctor. Nobody should do research. 
Why? Because in a totally egalitarian society, everybody's the same. Everybody's opinion has the same value. Absurd. Nonsense. Right? The Jews have an excellence to perfect, to contribute then with that excellence as a community and as a nation to the world. But how's it going to happen? Yaakov Dick. Avram, Yitzhak spoke to the world. Yaakov speaks to Kal Yisrael. And when he speaks to Kal Yisrael, he's trying to create that force and that energy that's emes. And that's mechitzas. Two mitzvahs that throughout history and the climax of history that the non-Jews have a problem with. Us being in Eretz Yisrael and sukkah as the ultimate test on the Day of Judgment. Eretz Yisrael, us being here, is sukkadik. It's our statement. Why do we need El Tissot? Why does the Jew need a land? Why not, if it's just, quote unquote, a religion, let them go about and do their thing wherever they are. Why do they need a land? Because only by us having our own place, our own space, is there a comprehensive 24-7 reality of utilizing every moment every opportunity for Kvod Shemayim. When Yeshua comes into El Tisal, the first thing he does is legislate urban legislation. What can you grow? What kind of plants? What kind of animals within the boundaries of the city? It's only by us being here and perfecting our thing and doing it. And that's not going to happen by us being apologetic. Of course, uh, any kind of civilized discourse with the universal community is admirable. Anytime there's an opportunity for that kind of Kiddush Hashem, of course, but not apologetic. We don't have to be shamefaced about doing our thing because it seems awkward, eccentric, different. For a few thousand years, this is what's worked in keeping Am Yisrael together, in keeping us as a nation and the ultimate success is in the balance. Yaakov, Sukkah, Mechitzas. Yaakov is the epitome of humility. Yaakven is a Ekev. But he's also the one who wrestles with the angel of Esau. Humility doesn't mean false humility. Humility means to know that anything I have or am is a gift from the Rebani Shlalem, including the ability to develop the innate gifts that I, that I was awarded. That's also Siata Deshmaya. You fellas heard the, the story of Diana Bromsky when he was called to give testimony the Humane Society was trying to outlaw Shrita in England. Comes into the court, the judge looks at the dossier, asks him, is it true, Diana Bromsky, that you're one of the world's leading authorities of, on Talmud? Yes. Is it true then that it follows that you are a world expert or perhaps the world expert on ritual slaughter. Yes. Judge closes the dossier and he says, tell me, Diana Bromsky, do you think it's in keeping with rabbinic humility 
to have answered in such a manner, Diana Bromsky says, maybe, maybe not, but I was enjoined to tell the truth. So I told the truth. Klal Yisrael, Emes, Titein Emes Lyakov. We have a message. To deny that we have the message is to deny our Jewishness. To be apologetic about it is to limp through history and be inefficient, incompetent. It's going to take us longer to get to the finish line. Some Russians that came to us and they told the story of how their parents were opposing the, their learning, Russian Balichuva. Initially, it was underground. Then, after Perestroika, they were able to, to go a bit more public, but he was still a minor. And he kept getting the police. The parents called the police. And anyway, what happened happened. And he, when he came to Al-Tisal, he decorated his sukkah with all of the fines, threats from the police, the letters that were sent to him during the years warning him that he has to stop going to the yeshiva. Every sukkah has a history of, if not parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, they went through that in hostile conditions when they were being threatened. Jews have been Mesa Nefesh throughout history for the message that Bakol, everything, our entire existence. And of course, that's the moment of peak Simcha. Peak Simcha is the recognition that I have a mission, I'm equipped to fulfill that mission, I'm part of a team, a greater reality, because there is a creator, and I am a creation of that creator, and the world has meaning, it has import. Avram starts the process by recognizing that Bira Doleket, Doleket, a palace that's heated, lit, warmed, Doleket. There's another shot that the Shemri Shmuel says. Doleket also means to pursue. Yaakov says to Lova, Loma Dolakta, why did you pursue me? For most people, truth pursues them. They're not pursuing truth. They're pursued by truth. They'd like to evade it. They'd like to escape the responsibility. I submit, fellas, the greatest simcha is when we get caught by the emiss and we step every step of our lives make an attempt to fulfill our chilek, our particular contribution to the totality of this saga called Am Yisrael, In El Yisrael, building sukkahs, and the message that it's all about the Rebbein Shalom's relationship to me, to the Jewish people, to history, and then that's how we're going to make an impact for the world community, Tikkun Olam. Es Avrom Bakol is in Gematria Tikkun Olam. Good job.